Okay, well, welcome back, everybody. Thank you for showing up today. Appreciate it. Today, we are going to continue our conversations about uh, diffusion in chemical fields in CompuCell. And we are going to uh, talk a little bit more about diffusion, just diffusion, quad diffusion, and then we're going to get into a question that somebody asked last time, which is how do you have um, secretion and absorption uh, in CompuCell? And as always, I have to remind you that this class is live streamed and recorded. So we are going to start out by uh, just a quick summary of where people are with their projects as usual. Then we're going to talk a little bit about diffusion length, diffusion time, and equilibration time, which are very important biological and biophysical concepts. And after that, we are going to do a very short exercise on diffusion decay. And then the rest of the class pretty much will be on uh, secretion and absorption. And if we're lucky, we may get to do a little bit of chemotaxis at the end of the class. If not, we'll cover chemotaxis next week. So maybe I'll just start by asking people if they want to do project updates. Uh, Logan, do you have anything you want to say for project related? Mike? Okay. Carmen? Um, <clears throat> sorry, I've been a little bit sick lately. Um, nothing to update, but it's been going well. Okay. Uh, Nick, anything to add? Hey, um, no, not really. Me and Logan haven't haven't done anything since the last time. Ibrahim. Yeah, just I mean, we're working on um just setting up the GitHub as well and you know, making the just the basic template for how we want to. I guess, run the whole project. And JH and Elmer, I guess there's there's an issue with the, the, the model you're trying to run is an old one, and therefore uh, it doesn't run in the current version of Morpheus. Is that right? It's r right. We got it running in uh, the Docker container, and I could share plots from there. But the... Uh, the problem is that when we translate it into the newest version from Mercer so first, then we get a segmentation fault. And we, yeah, we will see. I'm, I think I'm still optimistic that we somehow get it running, but we are discussing now as well alternatives in our groups. So we will see. Okay. Well, I hope we are able to get that working. I know. Backward compatibility is always a bit of a problem for all you know, these homebrew software packages. Although the Morpheus people are really good about that kind of support. So definitely this week and next week are good for me to meet with people. So if you would like to talk about your projects in small groups, I'm welcome the opportunity to chat with you. Okay, so last time we talked a little bit about how to use fields, in particular, how to use that CC3D preferences window to do field scaling. Uh, sometimes it's convenient to have floating concentration gradients, sometimes it's more convenient to have them be fixed, depends on what we're trying to do. And it's also quite useful to use that scalar contours bar to, uh, to set uh, contour lines, ISO lines, which help you visualize concentration more easily than you can with your color perception. And I realized that in this, in this slide, I failed to update the uh, 
the field reference to the new format. So I need to do that. But I want to come back to this idea of the physics of diffusion. We mentioned last time that one of the things that is typical about diffusion is that biologically diffusion doesn't require energy and therefore it is a free process and biological systems, living systems use diffusion uh, pretty much wherever they can because they don't have to do any work to use it. But one of the problems with diffusion as a process is that it's fundamentally short range because the time it takes a molecule, if it's diffusing, or for that matter, a cell, if it's executing something that looks like diffusive motion, uh, to move a distance L goes like the square of the distance divided by the diffusion constant. And so that means that diffusion gets very slow when you go over long distances. And if you think again of the example of an axon in your body, which can have a, be a meter long, um, a typical protein uh, would take 300 years to go one meter. And so clearly uh, we can't use diffusion as the main transport process uh, in human bodies. It works great in a bacterium. It works great in a single eukaryotic cell of diameter 10 microns but over length scales of centimeters or meters, it doesn't work. And then we wrote down the simple diffusion equation and we set boundary conditions at the left and the right of our domain. And we said that the concentration then is a constant times position. So we get a linear gradient at equilibrium. And we played with that a bit. And we looked particularly if we have a source of chemical on the left-hand side of our field and we start with no chemical anywhere else, we watched that chemical diffuse in uh, from the left towards the right. And we see this typical profile that gradually straightens out with time. And depending on the size of the domain and the diffusion constant, it's going to take quite a while for that to straighten out. If the width of the domain is 100, then 100 squared is 10,000. Uh, and so we would typically expect that equilibration would take at least 10,000 Monte Carlo steps. And actually, that equilibration time is the time to get three times closer to equilibrium than we started with. So if we really want to equilibrate, we have to go quite a few diffusion times. So we're talking about typically, in this case, 10,000 times 10, 100,000 Monte Carlo steps for that pattern to equilibrate. Uh, we also did a little bit of playing with diffusion in environments where the diffusion constant isn't the same everywhere. In particular, we simulated uh, a very simplified frozen immobile membrane and what happens when we have different diffusion constants in the membrane, typically membranes impede the movement of molecules across them. And we modeled what would happen if we had an ion channel. And one of the things, of course, that's interesting about the ion channel is that we get <coughs> higher concentration on the outside than we would without the channel, which makes sense but the chemical has to come from somewhere. So we actually have a depletion of the chemical on the inside of the ion channel. And if we looked, uh, plotted the concentration along the axis of that channel, uh, we'd see uh, a shape where far away from the channel, the concentration is what it would be everywhere. Near the channel, we'll see a sigmoidal gradient of the concentration. And so now I want to come back to understanding uh, decay in chemical diffusion, because we've so far talked about a diffusion with no decay, and then the concept of diffusion length. So if I want to write a diffusion equation, 
uh, with decay, typically we assume what's called first order kinetics. That is that the rate of disappearance of the chemical is proportional to the concentration of the chemical. And that's equivalent to uh, radioactive decay it means that the survival or loss of the chemical is independent of its concentration. Each molecule decays independently. There are situations in reality where the decay rate is slower at high concentrations, and there are also situations where the decay rate is faster at high concentrations. Uh, one thing we do know, though, is that if we have no chemical, we better not have any decay because the concentration can't go negative. And so at least to first order, uh, we expect that the decay rate will be linear in concentration, at least for low concentration. And typically we write gamma for that decay rate. And so now our diffusion equation has a second term. And we already knew that actually in our XML because we had set the global decay constant to zero when we did our simulations. If we convert uh, the 3D model to 1D, then that Laplacian becomes simply a second derivative with respect to position. And this is actually, we're not going to solve this explicitly, but it's, it's something you can solve analytically. And what you get, if you start with a concentration spike in a given position at zero, is you'll get a Gaussian, a decaying Gaussian, that will spread, it will widen, and its amplitude will decay in time. And the net amount of material decays exponentially over a time scale, which is one over gamma. The bigger the decay constant, the faster the material disappears. And so this is fundamentally an exponential decay process. If we were in a biophysics course, as opposed to a computational biology course, then I would spend more time doing the analysis of this. And if you're interested in the analysis, that biophysics textbook I recommended uh, goes into great detail about solving the diffusion equation analytically and understanding exactly how it works. Once we have you know, diffusion time doesn't depend on decay. That L squared over D, it doesn't have a gamma in it. Diffusion length, on the other hand, is a concept that only makes sense in the presence of either uptake of a chemical or decay of a chemical. And so typically in a living organism, molecules are secreted or absorbed uh, far away from where they're going to be used. When you breathe, oxygen enters your lungs. It's transferred from uh, the lungs into hemoglobin in your blood. The cells that transport the hemoglobin move through your body. They release that oxygen in less, in less oxygenated tissues. And then that oxygen will diffuse through those tissues to be used. Similarly, waste products like carbon dioxide uh, are released in the same way. Nutrients like glucose are distributed that way, and also growth factors and toxins are moved that way. And so one of the key things that we need to know is how the concentration of a chemical uh, varies as we move away from the where, place where it's produced. Uh, and how far it gets. And the diffusion length is a measure of the typical distance a molecule can reach away from the place that it started out. The case where we'd be most, you typically most interested in this would be when we are looking at tissues and capillaries. Most oxygen and glucose in the body are transported in the blood, and so concentrations are high at the surface of capillaries. As we go further away into a tissue, which uses it up, those concentrations go down. Since cells need a minimal level of oxygen and glucose to survive, uh, the rate at which that concentration decreases determines the separation between capillaries. If cells are too far away from the capillary, they're going to die. 
uh, in developing embryos, uh, gradients of diff uh, diffusible morphogens, uh, growth factors in particular, typically define the uh, location and shape and size of organs. Uh, in adults in wound healing, uh, that's also critical to uh, maintaining stem cell niches and inducing proliferation of cells. And finally, in tumors, the same kinds of mechanisms that maintain tissues when they're being built or in homeostasis in adults uh, lead to invasiveness and resistance. So I'm going to skip the, the, uh, the mathematics here because we're going to go back and do it in a, in a simpler way in a minute. Uh, in this case, I'm actually showing the analytic solution um, for the chemical field uh, with decay. And what I'm going to find is that the concentration will go like an exponential of the distance from the source times the square root of gamma over D. And that means in particular that the concentration decays exponentially away from a source. And the length scale of that decay is the reciprocal of the prefactor in the exponent, which is the square root of D over, over gamma. And that really makes sense. Excuse me for a second. I'm going to close the door to this classroom because there are people out in the hallway. That really makes sense. The bigger the diffusion constant, the farther the molecule can get before it disappears. And the bigger the uptake rate, the shorter the distance it can go before it disappears. Why it has the form square root of d over gamma, we're going to have you play with uh, in a few minutes. Um, depending on the molecular species in the body, the typical diffusion length for uh, proteins and small molecules is about 5 microns to 150 microns. Oxygen can get a little bit further. Uh, there are some molecular species that go less distance because they bind explicitly to the extracellular matrix. But a rule of thumb would be that a typical diffusion length for a species of interest is between 50 and 150 microns. So that was an analytic derivation of this. I'd like to talk for a few minutes about a method that I think doesn't get talked about enough, uh, which can be very powerful. And when you're a physicist, you typically learn it in the context of fluid dynamics, uh, which is called dimensional analysis. And dimensional analysis looks at the equations that govern a system and asks not what the explicit mathematical solutions are, but rather something much simpler. If I know the units, that is length, time, weight, mass, charge, and so on, can I derive the functional form for the things that I care about just by looking at the units? We know that if we have an equation which has multiple terms, the units of each term have to be the same. I can't have apples plus oranges, doesn't make sense. If I have apples uh, minus something else, that something else has to have units of apples. And so if I look at the diffusion equation, I have dc by dt, change of concentration per time, is equal to the diffusion constant times the second derivative with respect to space of the concentration, minus gamma times the concentration, plus sigma, where sigma is the source, the rate at which the chemical is produced or enters the environment. Since I have those in an equation, it means that the units, whatever they are, of dc by dt, d del squared c, gamma c, and sigma all have to be the same. So if one of them were time, all of them have to be time. If one of them were length, all of them would have to be length. 
A dimensional analysis, while it's very simple, and in very complex systems, it may not give you enough to solve the problem completely, uh, is a very powerful way of deriving scaling relationships. And it's something that you should do automatically every time you write down uh, a model, because if you have a model where one term in an equation has units of mass and the other unit equal term in the equation has units of mass per time, you've done something wrong. And so checking that your dimensionals are consistent, that your units are consistent, is a very powerful way of catching mistakes. And so I strongly encourage people to always do dimensional analysis of the equations and models that they write as a way of checking, as a sanity check on what you've done. <laughs> and I should add that I've seen quite a few published papers, even in some fairly famous places, which are wrong, where they didn't even bother to check the dimensions of what they did. Um, so uh, it's, uh, it's something that people uh, really, there's no real excuse for not doing it. It only takes a few minutes. And so I do want to spend a few minutes on this because uh, it's not something that's unique to biology. If you're doing, uh, for that matter, if you are doing biology or chemistry or physics or engineering, uh, you should always check that your units are consistent. And so let's think about an example, which is a very physics example, perhaps. Uh, but it, I picked it because it's something that you learn in grade school or high school, typically in your uh, physics class, maybe in, when you're about 10 years old. And that is that if you have constant acceleration, the distance that you travel is your initial velocity times time plus one half the acceleration times time squared. And suppose that I didn't know what the units of velocity or acceleration were, but I know that the units of distance are meters. And suppose that I measure time in units of seconds. Well, on the left-hand side, uh, typically you write square brackets for units. I realize that looks like a Python list, so we have to remember that we're not doing Python here. On the left-hand side, we have units of meters. The first term on the right-hand side is V0 times seconds. And the second term on the right-hand side has units of A times seconds squared. Ultimately, all three of these have to have the same units, which has to be meters. And so that means the units of V0 have to get rid of seconds and add meters. And so that means the units of velocity are meters per time. For the acceleration, we have seconds squared, so we have to get rid of that. So we have units that are per second squared, and we are missing a meters, so the units of acceleration have to be meters per second squared. In this case, I know velocity is distance divided by time. I know acceleration is distance divided by time squared. So I haven't learned anything new. But in more complicated situations, I might not know a priori what the units were for those parameters that I'm listing. Elmer says he can see how we see whether units are correct, but he doesn't understand how I might derive a scaling relation in the problem. Suppose that I have a length in my problem. Suppose that the length the only length that I have in the problem were the size of a cell, 10 microns. And suppose that the only time I had in the problem were the cell cycle time of 24 hours. Then the only thing I can build that has units of length over time would be 10 microns per 24 hours. And so then the only thing that I could build would be cell diameter divided by cell cycle time. And so I would then have a scaling relation that the speed, whatever that meant, had to be proportional to the cell diameter divided by the cycle. 
if, if one really wants to do this in detail, um, I strongly recommend, there's a beautiful uh, textbook called uh, Fluid Dynamics for Physicists. And the first chapter of that book does nothing but dimensional analysis. It gets lots of examples and lots of exercises. Um, there's also a beautiful book by Chandra Shikhar, uh, the great hydrodynamicist who was one of my teachers um, back when I was a grad student, uh, where the first chapter also uh, does that. Uh, it's not, it's a little bit more um, involved because it's called me uh, magnetohydrodynamics. It's about He's really trying to derive what happens in, in plasmas. And so the equations get to be a little bit complicated, but fundamental ideas are still the same. They're still pretty simple. If you look up dimensional analysis in Wikipedia, actually, there's a pretty good example. There's pretty good. Okay. So our first little exercise is going to be uh, to look at the diffusion equation. And I've taken the diffusion equation and I've converted del uh, the, uh, the derivative uh, into the delta character. And so to, to think about finite differences rather than infinitesimal differences. And so remember, our equation is the change in concentration per time is equal to the diffusion constant times the second derivative of concentration with respect to space minus gamma C plus sigma. And let's start out by remembering what the units are of concentration. Well, the units of concentration are mass per volume. Now, the units I picked here may not be the ones that you would actually use uh, if you were in biology. Uh, biologically, you might use something like molar concentration. Uh, but for the purposes of this little exercise, let's assume that we measure concentrations in units of grams per cubic meter. Probably we would be doing things in terms of something per micron, cubic micron. But anyway, let's do grams per cubic meter. So I'm going to plug in what I know. C has units of grams per cubic meter divided by time. We'll use units of seconds. That's equal to D times gram per cubic meter. The second derivative with respect to space gives me meter squared minus the decay rate times grams per meter cubed plus sigma. And so your exercise is to tell me what are the units of D, gamma, and sigma. And so why don't people take a few, a minute or two and figure out what are the units of D, gamma, and sigma. Again, the thing to remember is that each term has to have the same units. If I look on the left-hand side, my units are grams per meter cubed second. So each term has to have those units. So maybe somebody can immediately tell me what are the units of sigma of secretion. Mike, somebody, Logan, Logan takes a guess of per second, per sigma, the last term on the right. Anybody else want to take a stab at it? Would it just be the grams over meters cubed per second? That's right. It has to be what's on the left because okay. it's not multiplied by anything. So it has to be exactly what's on the left. So yes, so the units of sigma are grams per meters cubed sec. Okay, so now people take a minute, having looked at that, and come up and tell me what the units of gamma and D are. Gamma is the next easiest one, and D takes a little bit more thought. 
Um, could gamma be just one out, like one over second? Perfect. Yeah, exactly. And actually, I've already shown you what the units of D are, but try to think it, try, pretend you didn't see what the units of D were, and now look at the pick, look at this equation and tell me what they are. Remember that D has to convert grams per meter to the fifth into grams per meter cube second. And I wrote it the way I did to be suggestive to make it clearer what you have to do. Is it just meters per squared second? Meters squared per second, sorry. That's right, perfect. The meter squared cancels that extra meter squared in the denominator, and the per second gives you the per second that you need. So again, it takes a little bit of getting used to, but it's not really very complicated, I think. You need a, a few practice. Great, so people got all of them. Um, again, the sigma was easy. Uh, D, uh, we had to get rid of that. We had to add that one per second. And for uh, and and get rid of the extra meter squared. And gamma is per second. So the decay rate has units of per second. So one over the decay rate is a time. And that's an important thing to note. Okay, so now we have a slightly harder problem. You have three parameters, sigma, the rate of secretion, D, the diffusion length constant, and gamma, the decay rate. And now I want you to tell me what the diffusion length is. And the hint is that the diffusion length is a length, so it has units of meters. So the question is, how can I combine sigma, d, and gamma to get something that has units of meters? So try it out. Sigma is the secretion rate. Sigma is the secretion rate, d is the diffusion constant, and gamma is the decay rate. And I'll give you one extra hint because there are going to be three little tiny exercises here. Not all of these exercises use all three parameters. It's a little bit like a puzzle. You're trying to fit things together. Is, is the exercise clear? What combination of sigma, d, and gamma has units of length? If you want to do these things very formally, and you have a bunch of parameters, and I'll type this in the chat. Suppose you have parameters A, B, and C. Well, actually, let's call it, let's call the parameters X, Y, and Z. What I do is I say I have my outcome, which has some units that I want. And I'll say parameter X is raised to the A power times parameter Y to the B power times parameter z to the c power. And then I ask, what values of a, b, and c give me the units that I need? That's a formal way of doing this analysis. And if you look at um, some of the books on systems biology, um, they take that very seriously. When people do um, flux balance analysis, it's all done that way. But here we're not going to be quite so formal. So can people come up with a way of combining sigma, d, and gamma together that gives me a length? So Elmer says that what I typed in the chat is confusing rather than helpful. So I'll ask you to ignore it until we're done. 
uh, and just solve the problem. I, I was trying to give a hint, but maybe the hint was actually distracting rather than helpful. Is it the, the square root of D over gamma? Great. So what happens if I do the square root, if I do D over gamma, I have meters squared divided by seconds, divided by divided by seconds, which gives me meters squared. And so the square root of that gives me meters. So that definitely does have units of length. Great. You'll notice that if I use sigma, sigma has units of mass, gamma, grams. There isn't any other term that can cancel that out. And so if I want to get a length by itself, I cannot use the secretion rate. So I know that that one can't be part of the solution. So here's exactly that result. Is that, do people, are people following that logic? If you have a question, please feel free to ask. Okay, so now let's do one, another one. And this one is called the equilibration time. This is the time the field takes to forget its initial configuration. So we want to know in, in our original case where we did the equilibration of the linear gradient, we want to know how long that would take. And that's actually a little bit of a trick, trick question in this case. And so I have, want to have some time. Time has units of seconds. I want to know what combination of sigma d and gamma gives me seconds. Elmer says one over gamma, and that certainly has units of seconds. You could ask, well, what about combining things with d or sigma? Well, if I combine d and gamma together, I have units of meters squared or meters. The only other way I can get rid of length would be to include sigma, but that would bring in units of mass. And so there is no other way to get a time except one over gamma. It's the only way I can combine those three things to get units of time. And so indeed the equilibration time goes like one over the decay rate. And I had said earlier, the answer to this, which was that the time, uh, typical time scale for these systems is one over gamma. If there are no decay in the problem or no sinks, the field never equilibrates. It never forgets its initial condition. The equilibration time is infinite. If gamma is zero, the equilibration time is infinite. One result of that is that even in systems which effectively don't have a decay, we almost all never turn the diffusion uh, decay rate to zero completely in our diffusion equation. Because if we don't have some decay, our specific initial conditions never disappear completely. And so our system then depends on the exact choice of initial conditions we make. We know biologically that that's not true. Okay. And the last one is the diffusion time. And the diffusion time is the question, how long does it take for a molecule to go from one point to another point? And to figure that out, we have to remember that that introduces another length in the problem, which is the distance from A to B, which I haven't written down. You could call that length L. We called that script L before. And again, this one, we did the answer. I already showed you the answer at the beginning of class. Uh, but imagine script L has units of length. And now I want to get a time by combining L, sigma, D, and gamma. And here you're going to face something that actually <clears throat> is a bit of a problem in dimensional analysis. 
which is that if I have enough parameters, there may be multiple ways I can combine them that give me the same units. But let's just start out by saying that, if, that we have a length, a distance we want to go L. What can I do with L that will give me units of time? And actually, this one we also did earlier. Uh, we derived it earlier, a different way. Does anybody see how to do that, to solve that? Well, if I want to get a time starting with the length, can I use sigma? I can't use sigma because it has mass. So that leaves me with D and gamma. Gamma doesn't have length in it, so I can't get rid of length just using gamma. So I have to start out with D and L. D has units of m squared, of length squared, and so I have a choice. I could either write L over D to the one half, or I could write L squared over D. If I write L squared over D, then I have length over length squared, which just cancels the lengths. And I'm left with one over one over time, which gives me a time. So in fact, length, the distance squared over D has to be what I want. Now you could legitimately point out that I could do some other things. I could square length squared over D. That would be give me units of time squared. And then I could multiply by gamma to get rid of one of the times. And that would also have units of time. And so there are more complicated possible constructions that I could do. And in this case, there isn't an immediately obvious reason that I shouldn't do that, except that uh, it looks more complicated. You could ask the question, does that other construct have some meaning in the system? Sometimes it does. Okay. So we have a distance here. I guess I wrote it dt instead of L is the distance. Distance squared divided by d has units of time. Okay, so now let's come back to CompuSelf for a moment, now that we understand what that global decay constant is doing. And let's do a simple exercise uh, where we create a chemical field, call it oxygen. We can use the one we used last week. And we're going to turn that global decay constant on. And an important thing that we're going to figure out later, well, I'll leave. It. I'll wait. I, I won't. I won't talk about that until we've done it. So before we had a concentration field where we had a, a fixed value at the left, a fixed value of zero at the right, and we plotted the concentration as a function of position. And so now I'd like people to go back, use the simulation you wrote last week, and now turn on that global decay constant give it a small value like one over a thousand, which gives us a time scale of a thousand Monte Carlo steps for equilibration. And I'd like you to run that. And once you run it, I'd like you to see whether you get an exponential decay of concentration from left to right, which is what you expect. You can also check how long the diffusing molecule takes 
big O a diffusion length, <coughs> that's the diffusion time, again, L squared over D. So the system takes a time one over gamma to equilibrate. The chemical goes a distance square root of D over gamma. And the diffusion time goes like L squared over D. You'll notice that those three things are formally independent. And so I can define a set of values of D and gamma that give me the right diffusion length, even with different values of D and gamma from those in the experiment. And in particular, what we will do is that biologically, the diffusion length matters a lot because it controls the concentration as a function of distance from the source, but the time to equilibrate may not matter so much. So very often what we'll do is we'll use smaller diffusion constants and smaller decay constants keep the diffusion length the same as in experiment. Um, but it's the time it takes numerically to solve the diffusion equation increases as D goes up. And so uh, using a smaller numerical value of D gives us a faster numerical solution. Okay, is the, is the exercise here clear? Any questions about that? So why don't people just take a minute or two to try to get that to work? Do people have their code from last week? And why don't people give me a thumbs up when they have it? Okay, Ibrahim already has it. If you have your code from last week, you have to change one line, which is where you have global decay constant, change it from zero to 0 0.001. If you have it working as a stretch exercise, change the value of the decay constant and see how the time and distance over which the chemical moves change. You should find that as you make the decay constant Remember, the diffusion length is the square root of D over gamma. So as you make gamma bigger, the diffusion length will be shorter, and that means you'll see the chemical tail off over a shorter distance. It'll also take less time for it to reach that position. Does somebody want to show what they got? Ibrahim, I think you said you had it. Do you want to show us what you got? Okay, uh, this was just me editing the global diffusion constant myself. Okay, great. So what happened? This one. What happened? So this is like I'll show the start, I guess, and then we can take a look right. at the, the new one. Perfect. Yeah. So this is the original diffusion constant. The decay constant. Sorry, I guess it's going much slower than it used to with the, with the zero decay constant. And so with this one, you'll, you should, it, it'll never reach a, a linear gradient. It will always be, it should always be exponential. So, so this is one actually, you can use the uh, model editor on the left. If you go up where it says steppable diffusion solver FE, open that up yeah, there where it says global, Global decay constant is 0 0.001. If you make it zero, then you'll be back to the linear diffusion case. Now you'll see the chemical will move further to the left. It takes quite a while, but it will eventually give you a straight line. And now if you put it back at 0.001, 
let's see what the diffusion length is. 0 0.001, so D is one divided by 0 0.001 is a thousand. The square root of a thousand is 33. So the typical length scale for this would be 33. So it would go by, down by one over E to one third of its initial value around 33. Does it do that? Starts at 10, its value of three around, you know, it looks pretty good. No, that's about right. If you made it point, point 0.01, so that's, that's one over 100. So you get 100, square root of 100 is 10. So now it should decay by a factor of three at 10, which it does. If you want it to be a little bit longer, you'd have to add another zero. So make it one over point one ten thousand point oh 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 one. That's I think one extra zero, and four zero. You know. And now that should give you a decay length of 100. It may take a little bit of time to get there. As you see, the, the bigger the diffusion, the bigger the fast, the, big, the bigger the decay constant, the faster the thing equilibrates. So you trade off the distance for the time. So here, it it should be equilibrated when the value at a hundred is about one over is about three. So you have to wait a little bit longer. And again, it gets painfully slow because things go like, the time goes like the square of the distance. So it takes a while. You say it's getting there close. It's, it's so close, but it's slowing down. It's slowing down. It's slowing down. Now we can give it another minute while people are trying it out. Okay, did other people get something similar? Did people need help? Okay, thank you, Ibrahim. That was great. Appreciate it. Okay. So we can if 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 you want to, you can play with this at home. Um, and uh, see, see, uh, explore it a bit more. Is the screen share okay? Am I back to screen sharing the PowerPoint? I just want yeah. to make sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So you should see something that looks. And you can play with the diffusion constant and decay constant to see. For example, if you multiply the diffusion constant by 10 and the decay constant by, well, if you, by, by 100, you should get the same thing. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say for the moment about bare diffusion equation. And now, clearly, if there are no sources and sinks, things aren't so interesting. So I have to tell you how to implement sources and sinks in CompuSense. So we've already written the diffusion equation. Here I'll have a sink, which I'm calling U, and a source S. And again, you get this kind of spread and decay when you have when you have a sink. Uh, biologically. Sources can come about in a variety of ways. The source could be the amount of the oxygen in the room above a petri dish. It could be the oxygen in your lungs, or it could be the oxygen carried in the blood. 
It could be, or uh, within cells, it could be a chemical that the cells secrete, uh, either uh, a chemical that crosses the membrane directly, like oxygen or carbon dioxide, or a chemical that cells actually actively secrete by uh, exocytosis through a vesicle, or it could be a chemical that they secrete through a pump uh, or through an ion channel. But one of the things that we have to be aware of when we're building models, and this is one reason that there are going to be quite a few options within CompuCell about secretion and absorption, is that different kinds of biological processes will have secretion and absorption happen in different places. And so you'll see that CompuCell will provide you a number of different options for how, where secretion and absorption happen. Uh, and that is because the biological systems you're modeling have different uh, patterns of secretion and absorption. So when we're going to implement secretion in CompuCell, uh, we have to decide which cells or subcellular components or non-cellular objects that we're representing as, cell, as generalized cells secrete. Uh, do we have... Uh, Cell, a cell type that represents blood vessels. We have a cell type that represents the air over the, over the tissue. Do we have a cell type that represents mitochondria that's secreting ATP, for example? Um, where, with respect to that cell object, secretion happens? Inside, outside, at the boundary, everywhere, at the center? Um, whether secretion happens over the entire surface of the cell or only under certain conditions. For example, only if the cell is in touch with medium, uh, as would happen, for example, uh, apical secretion of uh, epithelia. And then something that uh, we have to think about a lot uh, and has rather profound consequences for the way things work is whether we secrete at a constant rate constant flux, or whether we impose a constant value at a boundary. Biologically, we typically do constant flux, uh, but mathematically, constant boundaries are, are easier. If we have oxygen above a Petri dish, the concentration of the oxygen in the air really is a fixed value. And so in that case, constant value makes sense. Um, also, for oxygen concentration surface of blood vessel, uh, constant value pretty much makes sense. Um, on the other hand, if the cell is turning out a growth factor, it's producing the growth factor at a constant rate, and so constant flux makes sense. But we do have to ask biologically which of these conditions we're interested in. Um, CompuCell has a secretion plug-in. Uh, which we need to include in our markup language, in our CC3DML. Uh, it can be included in two ways because the, the way we did this stuff changed. Uh, and so there are two options within the markup language for doing secretion and absorption. And there also are Python options. And one of the things that we're going to find is typically uh, when you specify things in the markup language, then you can't change them in the Python. Uh, in the case of secretion and absorption, you can, and they're independent of each other and add. So if you specify it in the, in the diffusion solver ML uh, and in the secretion plugin ML and in Python, you'll actually have three different processes going on. So you're allowed to do all three at once. So they do add up. Um, so in this case, you don't have a failure. Well, you, you just have to know that if you put three things in, they all work. Uh, if we look back in the diffusion solver, um, there is a block uh, called secretion data. And we can say secretion uh, type, the cell type that's doing the secreting, bacterium, 0 0.1. That's constant flux. That means it will produce 0 0.1 units per Monte Carlo step. I can have a fancier specification to create on contact with 
Um, and then the bacterium will only secrete when it's on contact with other bacteria, macrophage or wall, for example. I can also specify a constant value, which is like the boundary conditions we did before at the edge of the simulation. Uh, secretion for bacterium constant concentration, or here wall constant concentration, will say that I'm not, that I'm churning out 0.1 per Monte Carlo step, but that the value at the surface is always 0.1, and that will be enforced. Constant rate or constant flux is the default. Uh, constant concentration and secretion on contact are options. Don't worry if that's a bit confusing, we'll play with it and you'll get some chance to explore it. You can also have a separate secretion plugin and that's available in the Quidit XML, CC3DML uh, code snippets. And the secretion plugin has the form of plugin named secretion. Uh, you have to give the, tell which field you're secreting into because you might have multiple fields. Uh, and then you say again, secretion type equals, that would give constant flux secretion. Secretion on contact or constant concentration. If you specify these both in the diffusion solver and in the secretion plugin, both of them will have. The order in which they're executed is that the Secretion plugin is executed first. The diffusion solver secretion is executed second. And if you do the Python, it's executed third. You'd say, why would that matter? Well, if you're expecting particular values, they may be slightly off because of the order in which you do things. In particular, if you have secretion and absorption, uh, the value you see may depend on if you secrete first and then you absorb, the value may be different from absorbing first and then secreting. The order matters. Not a lot, but a little bit. <clears throat> if we want to secrete on a cell-by-cell -cell basis as opposed to a cell-type basis, then as usual, we have to do things in Python. And so the first thing we have to do as usual is to load the secretion plugin in our XML. And then in the step function in the Python, we will reference the chemical field. And I actually may have the old reference form for the chemical field again. So I apologize if that's the case. Uh, and then we have to get something called a secretor, which is a method that handles secretion in Python. And then we have to tell CompuCell for each one of the cells individually, how much chemical to secrete per voxel per call of the solver. Uh, and there are going to be quite a few options. Um, we have to, because there are different places where secretion can occur. It can occur everywhere inside of the cell. It can occur at the boundary of the cell inside. It can occur at the boundary of the cell where the cell is in contact with a particular other kind of cell. It can occur right at the center of the cell. And that's done to support situations where we want to match a center model like Paul's physicist cell. It winds up, it doesn't work very well, but it's better than nothing. And we can at least match those kinds of simulations. Um, that's not a criticism of a physicist cell. It's just a, just a comment about the way the math works. Uh, if you're a center model, then there is no surface at which you can secrete. So you have to secrete at the center of mass. Uh, but in this context, it's not the best way. To do it. You can secrete everywhere in the cell. You can secrete just outside the surface of the cell. Uh, and you can secrete just outside the surface of the cell when you're in contact. Um, one of the things that you have to worry about is that the amounts are specified per voxel. And so if the area of the cell changes or the uh, surface area changes, then the amount that's secreted will change 
because it's scaled by the number of voxels. And so you can ask for the total amount. I can say, how much did I actually secrete per time step? Um, constant flock, a constant value is only available uh, if I do secrete inside the cell. It doesn't make sense in the other context. There's nothing mathematically wrong with it, but it just doesn't make biological sense. Okay. So if I'm going to use my Python specification, I use the secretion plugin bear, plugin name secretion and plugin. Um, and yes, I, and then you have to get a secretor reference. So I will have a handle here. I called it ATTR underscore secretor. And then I have to do uh, self dot get field secretor with the name of the field. One of the things that I haven't talked about a lot, and if you're using um, if you're using the uh, NanoHub version of CompuCell, you can't do it because the prints don't work. Actually, now the prints should work because you can actually open it. No, it's not there yet. Uh, this is a problem. We can't print to the to the player. We only print to the console in the in the version of uh, CompuCell it's on NanoHub. Um, there's a wonderful Python function called dir. And if you dir, print dir, uh, and then a handle or an object, it will give you a list of all of the information about the object structure, all of the methods and functions that are available on that object, all of the attributes that are available on that object. A lot of it's not very exciting, like the creator for the object, the instructor for the object, or, and so on. But um, if you want to know what can I do to this object, a dir will give you a list of all the things you can do to it. And so if you dir the secretor object, it'll tell you what all of the options are if you forget. Another thing that's pretty useful is that you might want to know how much chemical there is in the entire simulation uh, at any given time. And so there's a function. Uh, if I use the secretor object that I've just created, and I do the function, the method, uh, total field integral, that'll return the total amount of chemical in that field. So it's the integral over the whole field of that amount. Um, that's a, a pretty useful thing to have. The other one that's useful is if I want to know how much of the chemical is within the boundaries of the cell, a particular cell, there's a method amount seen by cell called on cell. And so that'll tell me how much of the chemical is inside of the cell. And you can imagine that those could both be useful things to know. Uh, how much oxygen is there in my dish, in my simulation? How much oxygen is there inside of my cell? So those are both function calls that you might want to use. So Elmer. So the, the field from PD solver is the name of the field. Elmer asks, what does field from PD solver mean? So, so. So if I created a field called oxygen, field for PD solver would be oxygen. If I created a field called ATP, it would be ATP. Um, the point is that I would have a different attractor, I would have a different secretor object for each field because I have to know, am I asking it for the amount seen, but what, what field am I asking it about? And so I have to create a reference for each field that I'm going to mod modulate. So a typical thing that we might do is we might say, uh, we call our secretor and we say secrete inside cell at boundary. And then we give it the cell we want to secrete at and the amount we want to secrete. If we want to know how much we secreted, because that's a per voxel call, we could say result equals 
a tractor, our field reference, a tractor secretor, dot secrete inside cell total count, everything in camel case. And perhaps unfortunately, what's returned is itself a composite object. So the amount that's returned is result dot total underscore amount. And I realized that there's some inconsistency about when we use underscores and when we use camel case. Uh, there was a period when camel case was very fashionable and then underscores got to be the way things were done. And so the newer, older functions have camel case and the newer functions have underscore. Um, and in a lot of cases, both of them work, but I, you have to try it out. I can't promise that both will always work. Of course, the things get the name the, the function names get long and they get even longer when you have the underscores compared to the camel case. Uh, Elmer says that he thinks that the underscores are more Pythonic and the and the camel case is more C plus plus ick. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know whether other people feel that way. Uh, but uh, so in any case, that's where we are with it. Uh, 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 the good news is that Twitit will will normally will tell you the correct form to use. Uh, I cannot promise that every possible permutation is in Twitit. In particular, some of these total count versions are not in Twitit. And so you may have to actually look at the manuals. We try to reduce the amount of time you have to look at the manuals, but some of these options you may have to look at the manual. That dir is good because it will always return all of the options. Okay. So let's look at a couple of these possibilities. Um, if we have actually a membrane and the chemical is diffusing across the membrane, if the chemical is diffusing across the membrane, then um, for example, at the top boundary of a cell where it's in contact with medium, then the rate of secretion should actually be uh, the amount just inside the membrane. And so it'll secrete just inside the membrane. If the cell secretes everywhere on its surface, then we secrete inside cell at boundary. If we have an epithelial layer where the cells only secrete at the top, then we would secrete at boundary on contact with. And when we have on contact with, we have to have a list of the cell types where we secrete. And so as you see, we can start out with, we're going to say, we're going to secrete a molecule called ATTR. So the first thing we do is get a reference to that chemical field for secretion. That's the first line here. Our secretor handle is self dot get field secretor of ATTR. And then our first option, which would be the one at the bottom left, would be our handle dot secrete inside cell at boundary, the handle to the cell, and then the secretion rate, which here I've just made 300. If I want to know how much I secreted, I would say result is secretor handle dot secrete inside cell at boundary total count. Again, with arguments of the cell and the rate. And if I wanted the amount, then it would be result dot total amount. If I want to only secrete when the cell is in contact with medium or wall, then I have secrete inside cell at boundary on contact with cell, the rate, and then a list of the cell types whose contact will let me secrete. And if I then want to know how much I've got, I have secrete inside cell at boundary on contact with total count. So you can see these get relatively long. Uh, there are a lot of permutations. All right. On the other hand, once you know what the nomenclature is, 
you can figure out by changing it. If I wanted it instead of being inside the cell, I want it to be outside cell, I would change the inside to outside. If I wanted it everywhere within, within the cell rather than at the boundary, I would get rid of at boundary. And so you can, you can mutatis mutandis, you can change these. Uh, some of them don't exist because some of them don't make sense. So for example, secreting at the center of the cell on contact with doesn't make any sense. You're not, the center never is in contact with something. Uh, if your cells are secreting on with exocytosis, with active secretion, then the secretion actually happens outside the cell rather than just inside of it. And so in that case, I would use outside cell instead of inside cell. Everything else stays the same. In particular, if I think of, if I now, if I'm thinking about my two-dimensional sheet of cells and I'm looking at it from the top, and so the cells are secreting from their top surface, then they're going to secrete everywhere I can see. And in that case, I would typically say secrete inside cell, because actually what's happening is I'm thinking of the secretion that's happening at the top. So that's an option. And then as I mentioned, in particular, to agree with center model simulations and some older simulations using CompuCell and other of POTS model methodologies, we have the option to secrete at the center of the cell. And that's an abbreviation for that is COM, center of mass. I would not recommend using that unless you have to. So there are a lot of options. So your assignment here I'd like people to create a 100 by 100 lattice with a single frozen cell in the center. I create a chemical field called oxygen. Add the secretion plugin. So basically, you can use the simulation that you've got now, um, but you're going to create a single frozen cell in the middle of the simulation. Set the diffusion constant to 1 and the decay constant to 1 over 100. Use periodic boundary condition, no initial concentration. And then I want you in the CC3 DML have uh, uniform secretion and constant concentration secretion. And use that plot that you just did, which plots along the x axis, uh, along the middle of the simulation, and see what you get. So take the simulation that you just ran and change the boundary conditions to periodic. Create a single cell in the middle. If you don't remember how to freeze it, you can look it up in the manual or look at what we did last time. And add secretion in the CC3D ML. So this is just what I have. And if I just keep running it, the concentration in the center, which is where the cell is. Yeah keeps increasing, but nowhere else. It's not like going anywhere. Okay, let's look at your XML for that. So this is just the secretion plugin, and then this is the field, I misspelled it, so I guess pay no mind to it. But um, but it's just the, here's the secretion type. This is just the same name as last time. Okay, hold on a second. So look in the chemical field. What's the chemical field called? <laughs> Okay, so it is matched because if, if they don't match, it won't work. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I misspelled it here, so I had to continue misspelling. Right, that's fine. That's fine. Diffusion coefficient. Oh, it's because you've got diffusion and decay coefficient set to zero in the cell. Oh, in the cell, you're right. So this should just be the same, I guess? As... Yeah, you could do that or just comment it out either way. But yes. Oh, make them the same. There, right out. Can you still see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. This looks great. Okay, thank you.
because if you're secreting inside the cell and there's no diffusion, the kind of diffusion constant is zero, it just sits there. Yeah, that makes sense. Good. So now you could try, while you're waiting, you could try changing the, uh, whether you secrete inside, outside, constant value, and so on. And so right. I'll, I'll try those, I guess. Thanks. But that looks great. Mike, uh, how'd it go? Mike and Nick, did you get something? So this was, I assume this was constant and this was uniform. That's right. Um, and then we looked at the outside the boundary and compared it to the inside the cell at boundary, um, which were interesting, but I'll keep it inside the cell at boundary with no other secretion for this quick demo. Um, so here it is inside the cell membrane, starting. Um, and then you have to reshare. Now we're now we're just seeing clear. Okay. You know, I, I guess I shared the one instead of my whole screen. Let me try this. Can you see this now? That's great. Um, so the tweet that you saw, but the the player you didn't. So. Um, I'm just gonna change the color of this really quick because it's very difficult to see. How would I change the color of my oxygen graph? Okay, go to cell color and where it says cell border color uh, on additional colors, click uh, there I and make to, it black or something. I wanted to change on this. Oh, oh, oh that, that you have to do in your in Twitter. Okay, well, I can do that really quick then. So if you go back to Twitter, yeah, let's do like where you say um, the big thing is the size, make the size something like five instead of one. And in in when you create that in line, uh, okay. Uh, make it 21, make it five. Okay. Yeah, because I can see it fine, but I feel like you guys would have more trouble. Yeah, that looks better. So you can see our concentration starts really high, right where that is. Um, and it updates every 10 Monte Carlo steps. So it starts to dwindle out. I, I didn't see too much here. You can kind of see it getting slightly lighter, um, but it's getting out that membrane. As you can see, um, just our little concentration gradient. Um, and just for specifics, oh, that has a lot. Um, it had a coefficient of 0 0.1. Um, so yeah. Okay, great. Does anybody else have something they want to show? So, you can do secretion data inside of the uh, inside of the step of the diffusion steppable. One way to do it. Uh, you can also, and you should get something like this. If you use constant concentration, you'll see that within the cell, the concentration really is constant. If you use constant flux, you'll see that there is a variation within the cell as well as without it. Which of those is appropriate depends on the biology. If I go far from the cell, uh, these two situations are basically indistinguishable. The actual values are different because constant concentration, if I have a constant concentration of 10, the concentration won't be more than 10 anywhere. If I have a constant flux, the equilibrium value will be the flux divided by the decay rate. So if the decay rate, if the secretion rate is one and the flux and the decay rate is 0 0.01, then the equilibrium value will be around 100. Okay. Now one can play with all these different possibilities. Um, I think that the next thing that we I was going to have you do um, would be to do the same thing with Python. But we, I think, let's do, let's defer that. We could do that as a little homework exercise. Um, and then what I would like to do instead is let's worry about absorption. We talked about secretion, but let's do uptake. Um, and that one we will always use Python for. 
And so it's basically symmetrical. Instead of secrete, we'll do uptake. Uh, and you'll get your Python practice there. Now we will, we will have a little bit, we won't use up so much time in the exercise. Okay. So this is the Pythonic version of the same thing. And it shows the results for some different options. Inside cell, the concentration is biggest at the, bound, at the middle of the cell. Uh, inside cell at boundary, you see the concentration is the biggest at the boundary and decays inside the cell and outside. If I secrete at the center, I get a spike at the center, which I just Constant concentration inside cell, it's flat over the cell and constant, uh, constant uh, secrete outside the cell looks like secrete inside the cell, except that it's displaced just a little bit. So those are the different morphologies of the pattern. Okay, so let's talk about uptake. <laughs> uptake, like a secretion, can happen in a variety of different ways biologically. Um, you can have diffusion of something like oxygen across the membrane or water across the membrane. Uh, just the way it can diffuse out of the cell, it can diffuse into the cell. But there are two other processes that happen. Uh, one of which is endocytosis. The cell will actually uh, use its membrane, close the membrane around material outside of the cell and pull it into the cell. That's the opposite of creating vesicles and releasing them out of the cell. And so that happens at the surface of the cell uh, and uh, pulls in relatively large amounts of material at once. And then the other thing that you'll get, which is specific for absorption, is that the cells have on their surfaces a variety of receptors of molecules that specifically bind particular targets. Now, the number of those molecules is not very large. And so for species like oxygen, they're not that significant. However, for uh, growth factors and signaling molecules like uh, fibroblast growth factor, transforming growth factor beta, uh, and molecules of that kind, their uh, density outside the cell is very low. And so uh, when they bind to molecules on the surface of the cell, receptor molecules on the surface of the cell, that could actually change the concentration significantly. And so what I'll see is that uh, the concentration of the chemical will actually decrease uh, even though it's the cell that's using it up, you'll see that the concentration of the chemical uh, will be will decrease a fair distance away from the cell. The cell basically digs a hole for itself. Now that hole could, depending on the diffusion length, uh, be pretty big. And there's a picture here at the bottom left trying to illustrate uh, illustrate that. Now the uptake rate that we're going to use in, in this in CompuCell will be very simple. Uh, in reality, those uptake rates could be relatively complicated. The one thing that we can't do is simply uptake at a constant rate, because if we did that, the concentrations would go negative. We know it's so uptake in CompuCell, um, there are two ways we could do it. Uh, we could simply use decay to represent uptake. Um, and in the old days, that's what we did. We'd say decay coefficient inside cell type X bacterium is such and such. Um, the problem is that very often when we have uptake, we wanna know how much we took up because it's of something like a nutrient or a growth factor, which is gonna change the behavior of the cell. Uh, and uh, if we do it that way, we don't get that in. And so uh, typically um, for uh, uptake, unlike secretion where we have a bunch of XML options, for uptake, we're almost always going to use Python. And the uptake function for CompuCell is perhaps oversimplified. I'd love it if somebody would go back and write some better uptake functions, uh, but it's not terrible for what uh, we need. 
Um, the uptake function is going to have two numbers. It's going to have the fractional uptake per time step. And then it's going to have a maximum. So if we look at the concentration, for small concentrations, the uptake will be linear in the concentration. And then there's a hard cutoff that says you can't take up more than a certain amount per unit time. In reality, there'd be some sigmoid rather than a, than a, than a hard saturation. It's not a terrible assumption. Um, again, uh, these are done per pixel rather than per cell. And so we will often have to rescale things by the number of voxels in the cell or the number of voxels at the surface of the cell. And so typically when we do uptake, we will use total count and then ask how much we got. How much glucose did we get, did the cell get per unit time? That's the amount of energy and material that's available for the cell to grow. How much oxygen did the cell get per time? How much growth factor did the cell get? And so almost always we're going to use uptake and then dot total amount to figure out how much we took up. Uh, one thing that uh, CompuCell will do is just the way the pressure is defined in CompuCell to be minus what we would expect. The uptake is, is thought of with reference to the chemical field rather than with the cell. And so uptake will almost always return a negative number. And so you'll typically have to put a minus sign in front of it to get the number you want. In other words, if, you, if the cell is taking up oxygen, it will return minus the number that you want because it'll ref, it, it gives you the number with respect to the field rather than with the cell. So just be aware of that. Okay. The secretor is the same. So you'll use the secretor plugin as before, and then you'll do, uh, you'll create a secretor object, uh, and then you'll do uh, uptake on it. And again, the arguments are the cell ID, or sorry, the cell handle, uh, the maximum amount, and then the relative. As usual, uh, you're going to have the option of where you take things up. In reality, the amount taken up should be proportional to the difference in concentration between the inside and the outside. Uh, for technical reasons, we don't have that, uh, although you can fake it out if you want to. I'm not going to do that in this class. I will just show you how to do it if you're interested. Um, but uh, you do have to think about where secretion happens <clears throat> and also whether I mean, absorption happens and whether absorption happens everywhere or just on certain surfaces of the cell. And so not exactly the options are not exactly identical to the ones in the other one case, but they're pretty much this parallel to it. So what, what will you do? You will get a handle for the field so you'll get use get field secretor. And I realize secretor seems funny when you're doing uptake, but the, 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 the computational function you're using is the same. And then you'll say the result is the handle dot uptake inside cell at boundary total count, which will turn the amount that you've taken up, uh, the handle to the cell, the maximum amount you're allowed to take up. You can always make that a large number if you want it to be proportional without limit. And then the percent, the, the, the fractional amount, which will typically be a small number, 0.001. You can also reference, say that you only take up on the top surface or the bottom surface of the cell, in which case you do on contact with. If you take things up through endocytosis or surface receptors, then you absorb just outside the surface of the cell instead of inside. It seems a bit counterintuitive, but it, but it, it can have significant differences in the results. And so you can take out, take up the material just outside of the cell instead of just inside. 
It's also possible to take up everywhere in the cell. Uh, that is particularly useful if you imagine the cell actually being the top surface of a 3D object looking down from the top, in which case all of the surface is actually taken up. And again, you can do absorption at the center of the cell. Well, secretion at the center of the cell isn't wonderful. Absorption at the center of the cell really is a bit of a mess. So I recommend not using it. Uh, again, you can. And if you want to match results from a different method, then that's a useful. Okay. So why don't we take a five minute break? Uh, and then your exercise will be to uh, take the simulation that you just worked with. Um, and now you use Python uh, and you'll do uptake inside that cell. And we'll have two, three groups again, Ibrahim will be on his own. And then the other two groups will reform. Uh, Ibrahim, you can do uptake inside cell. Uh, uh, JH and, and uh, Elmer can do upside, uptake inside cell at boundary. And uh, Nick, um, you two can do uh, uptake uh, outside cell at boundary, okay? When you said um, do it on the axes, I didn't know if you meant like all the way around or just like the, like the X equals zero and Y equals zero. So, so you're doing um, here we're doing an uptake. Yes. So there has to be some chemicals coming from somewhere. Yeah, there should um, be. So here it's coming from those two boundaries. I might I might change this to start with a cons constant concentration everywhere, and then use periodic boundary. Or, or use constant value boundary conditions at the boundary. That might work better. So, so yeah, it may, I would have the global decay coefficient should be zero. Okay. Maybe that'll help, yeah. And then I would use constant value on the boundaries, on all, all four boundaries. All four, okay. I'll do that. I guess I'll see if it actually starts uptaking. Looks like it is. Yeah. If you want to see it faster, start with the initial concentration 10 everywhere. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that, that would work too. I think this looks like it's uptaking at least. Yeah. It definitely is. Nice. Yeah, I guess that looks like it's working. Just for just for my peace of mind, why don't you change it to have initial concentration of ten everywhere? Okay. Let's see what the equilibrium state looks like. I mean, they're both interesting cases. One where the chemical comes from the outside, one where... So initial concentration of 10. There you go. Mm -hmm. And there you go. Now, oh, wow. It's... Um... Should I remove, should I make the boundary? Okay. Just no, there we go. No, that's perfect. That's good. Okay. Okay, that's it. That's that's what you'd get if you ran it long time and not long enough time. Nice. It's already equilibrated. All right, thank you. Great. So let's look at what you did with the uptake. Let's look at your Python. Yeah. So I people just, can see how you I did it. Or so 
in self.cellist. Well, mm -hmm. before that, I have set free tour equals self.get field and then the field name. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just do separate or dot uptake inside cell and then cell because we're iterating through the cell list. And then it said like maximum uptake and minimum and like fractional uptake. Right. I wasn't a hundred percent sure what the difference between those two was, but I just picked the fractional one to be smaller than the, the main one. Okay, so so the fractional one, this is important, so I want to explain it for everybody. The fractional one is the literally the fraction. So if if point one means that if there's one unit of chemical in a lattice, it will take up point one and leave point nine. So that's equivalent to writing a decay rate of point one, a gamma of point one. Okay. So that's actually taking up a lot. And if you look at your simulation, you'll see that the value in the center of the cell is almost zero. Yeah. Because you're, you're absorbing a lot. So this cell is basically a black hole sucking out all the, all the chemical. Um, if you made that, if you made it 0.001, for example, then the, then the, the well will be shallower. Yeah, I think it's going much lower. It, it used to go to near zero, but now it's going to only like 0. 0.8 or 8. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so that's controlling basically that. The, the maximum is a little bit more complicated. It's taking up that fraction at every voxel in the cell. Um, but the maximum it can possibly take, but the, 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 the one is saturation. In reality, biologically, there's a limit to how much you can take up. And so um, the, that, that saturation is telling you that the most you can take up is, is 10, one. In this case, the value of the chemical field is at most 10. So 10 times 0.001, is 0 0.01, which is less than one. So the saturation doesn't do anything. If your, val if your, if your uptake were 0 0.1, then that saturation would have an effect. Or might so have it's, effect. it's the, like the maximum amount the whole cell can take up? No, it's per voxel again. Okay. Um, everything. It doesn't, unfortunately, that, that, that the, uptake, the, 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 the uptake doesn't know how many voxels the cell has. So everything is by vox. Okay. Um, if you wanted to, to know what the result is, you'd add total count. So if you do, if you put in after, um, no, inside of the, inside, change the secretor name, add the words total count after inside, no, sorry, in line 36. Uptake inside cell total count. Okay. Camel case. And now set that equal to something. So so 36 is res equals, result equals that. Okay. okay. And now and now you have to, after that, you have to somehow display it. So you would have to say it would be res dot. And I never remember if it's total amount or total count. I think it's res dot total amount. Do I do total underscore. Oh, no, it's that one has lower. It has it has underscores. Total underscore total underscore amount underscore amount. Total, total underscore amount, right? Yeah, and then that's no no parentheses. No, oh, that's just it. And then uh, you could print that. I had to print this. Yeah. I don't remember how the printing works in this. Can you remind me? Well, it'll unfortunately it'll print to the to the console. I can do that. I guess that should be fine. Right now. Okay. 
And so now it should tell you how much you're taking up at each point. If you hit pause, it'd be easier to see what's going on. Okay, why is it not printing at? Hmm. Let's see. Keeps printing cell ID equal. Oh, because it only prints every. This should be every cell. month. Yeah. Where's that total amount? Huh. That's interesting. Why don't we put something in, in, why don't we print something like print quote, total amount, comma. So we know that we are actually executing that line. There we go, fine. Okay. Right on. No actual right. total amount. All right, let's try again. So res does not have. Okay, so let's do our my trick, which is uh, before you do that, cop comment out line thirty seven, and above line thirty seven, print parenthesis. DIR, DIR, parenthesis, RES, close parenthesis, close parenthesis. This? Yeah. OK. And you'll want to hit pause after it's run one, one step. Now let's look at the, the output. Okay, so this is a list of all the things that exist inside of res. This it's one? It's T-O-T underscore so, amount, not total. Yeah. As I say, that's a very useful, that, that, that dir is a very useful way of remember if you can't, if you've got a typo, it helps you a lot. Okay, now, okay, now let's look at the result. Okay, so it is producing a negative number. So we probably want to minus that, but that's the amount that's being taken up. Okay. And you'll see that amount is going down slowly. Mm -hmm. yes. As it digs a hole, it's not able to take quite as much. Okay, that's interesting. So this is the whole cell, how much the whole cell That's the whole cell. Yeah. So it sums all the voxels? Exactly. Okay. Nice. Thank you. Great. I hope that, I, I don't know if people are watching that, but I hope that was helpful. Does anybody else have something they want to show? Nick, Mike, were you able to get it to work? Um, yeah, I could share mine if you like. Great, please. Um, okay, so the one that I did was um, uptake add boundary. Mm -hmm. um, and I started it with a uniform concentration, initial concentration of one. But okay, great. No, yeah, that's fine. And this is what my concentration started to look like. Oh. Oh. Hold on. Let's see if I can get it to play. So right at the beginning, you can see it's dipping right around the membrane. Um, and it seems like it's going a bit slow, but it's moving. 
I wonder if that's a Zoom. Sometimes player and Zoom don't don't interact well, so it slows <coughs> it slows the when you when you're zooming. Sometimes the screen sharing it will slow the. You know. hmm. Yeah, I definitely experienced that. But that looks pretty reasonable. Yeah. Yes, I can. Yeah. Anybody else have something? Either either something they want to show or a problem they want to help debug with. Okay. All right. Thank you both for showing your, your results. That's good. So there, again, there are a lot of different games we could play with this. Um, here I, I did uh, set the values is 10 on the boundary, but one is fine. Um, I, I used a small global decay, although one doesn't need that. And then I tried a bunch of different, uh, Abraham, go ahead. I just had a question. Can you like change the rate of your uptake? Like if you yes. want a localized area to always be like have some sort of specific field value? Yes. Yes, you can. How would you do that? Uh well, you can you can make that uptake rate a variable. And each time step you can measure the concentration and Remember, I said in reality, the uptake rate would depend on the difference in concentration between the inside and the outside of the cell. Uh, so if I have a, a, a con if I had, for example, in a dictionary, uh, a number which represented the concentration inside the cell, uh, I could say, I could measure the concentration outside the cell because there's a command which I showed earlier which is um, instead of actually doing the uptake, you can ask for the concentration. I could ask, what is the concentration outside the cell? I could compare that concentration to the concentration inside the cell. And I could then, instead of saying the uptake rate is 0 0.1, I could say the uptake rate is 0 0.1 times the difference in concentration between the inside and the outside. And in that case, the, the, the uptake rate would automatically scale if the level inside and the outside of the cell were the same, there would be no uptake. The bigger the difference, the more it took up. So that's possible. So I can I can uh, make either the maximum amount or the uptake rate uh, a variable. Um, it's a little awkward because I have to make some measurements and adjust it. But for example, suppose that I have a cell and the cell represented a cancer cell. And the cancer cell could either be going through aerobic metabolism or anaerobic glycolysis. Uh, in the case of aerobic metabolism, the uptake rate of glucose might be lower than it is in the case of uh, glycolysis. And so then the uh, uptake rate on glucose, if I had a glucose field, would be different depending on the state of the cell. And the oxygen rate consumption would be different as well. So absolutely, those could be uh, variables, um, which you could adjust depending on the state of the cell or the concentration of the chemical inside and outside. Was that was that answering your question, or was would, uh, did I miss miss the? Uh... Yeah, that was it. Thank you. Great. Okay. Okay. Um, any other, I guess for a boy, it seemed like a short class to me. I, I may not have felt that way to you, but it seemed short. Um, any other questions or comments about this? Let me just walk through some results. So here I have, um, actually, I'm not, I'm not sure. 
picture. So here I have some results that I got. Um, here I have uptake inside the cell everywhere, uh, uptake inside the cell at the boundary, uptake inside the cell at the center of mass, uptake uh, outside the cell at the boundary. You notice inside and outside the cell look very similar. Uh, it's just a slightly different area. Inside the cell at center of mass, I get a spike at the bottom, a point. Um, inside the cell, I get a rounded contour. So they're all similar, but not identical. Uh, notice that if I go outside the cell, uh, pretty far outside the cell, the shape of the curves are pretty similar. If I'm between region 0 and 20 in this, or 80 and 100, I can't really tell the difference. When I get closer to the cell, it makes a difference. Okay. One other thing that is interesting to do, which which can be relevant, and I'm not going to ask you to do this as an exercise, but I want to talk about it, and maybe we do this as a homework, um, is that in our case, the chemical is all coming from the far away. It's coming from the boundary of the cell lattice. Uh, but in a lot of cases, the source of the chemical is close to the thing that's consuming it. In particular, uh, suppose that I have an aggregate of cells that are floating in or surrounded by a liquid, and the liquid carries oxygen or glucose or a growth factor. Then the liquid itself will be a supply of the chemical, uh, very often at constant concentration. And so one thing that is quite interesting to do is to say that there's a secretion, which you can do in the diffusion solver, which is that you have constant concentration of your chemical produced by the medium, by the material, by the space around the cell. And that will act as a source, not at a long distance from the cell, but right up against the cell. And that, that uh, typically is what happens in cancers if you're simulating a tumor. Um, and if I do exactly the same thing, this was going to be an exercise, but I'll show you the result. If I do exactly the same thing, now with constant concentration in the medium, everywhere outside the cell now is fixed to be 10, because the medium always has a value of 10. And so now the only differences in concentration are happening inside the cell. If I have uptake everywhere inside the cell, I basically get a smooth, uh, almost parabolic profile. If I uptake inside the cell at the boundary, I have a step function. If I uptake at the center of mass, I get a linear gradient. And outside the cell at the boundary, I get another step function. And so in all of these cases, I have slightly different results. Um, in this case, it's not so much the shape of the curve that's important, but if I wanted to ask how much of the chemical am I taking up at any given time, I'll get a different result. And so I think that that's something that you could play with. Um, take the code that you've written so far, add secretion by medium instead of at the boundary and see what happens. Um, once you have those things working, and then this was the last thing we was going to do today, we'll do it next week instead. Uh, then you can begin to build a tumor simulation, an avascular tumor spheroid, where you're going to have this tumor cells are going to take up oxygen and glucose from the environment. They'll turn that into cell volume, so they'll grow at a rate that depends on the availability of the nutrient. And you'll be able then actually to build a tumor simulation where the cells grow, divide, if they have enough oxygen. If they don't have enough oxygen, they will become quiescent. If they really don't have enough oxygen, they die. And you'll be able then to build a, begin to build a tumor simulation. So next week, we will do uh, a little bit more on this, and I'll also talk about chemotaxis, how you have cells move in response to chemical concentrations in the environment. Because if, here we've all been doing coupling between cells and the environment by having the cells secrete or absorb chemical. 
but cells can also move in, con in, in response to the chemical concentration. And so next week, we'll talk about how to do that. Are there any questions before we break? Did the breakout rooms work? I know, Ibrahim, you couldn't join a breakout room. I'm sorry about that. But for the other people, did they work OK? Were you able to, 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 to talk in the breakout room OK, Nick? And, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I thought it was helpful. Me and me and Mike were in one, and um, we definitely talked a little bit, like what uh, we were coding and stuff like that. Right. It works a little bit better when when Giuliano is here, because the problem is I can't leave the main session because I own the meeting. I can't leave them. I can't leave the main session to join the breakout room. Wow. And so. So if Giuliano is here, then he can circulate in the breakout rooms and give help. Uh, it's a little harder for me to do that uh, the way this is organized. Hmm. Um, I, I did think it was helpful, though. It was good for us probably all to be able to share our screens instead of just having to yeah. trade in the slot. Yeah, I, I think I think uh, I think that and I, I appreciate people being willing to show their code and work on the code together. Uh, in class, I, I know uh, when it works, it's great to show what you got. When it doesn't work, if we can look at it together and, and debug it, I hope that's helpful. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. I appreciate you being here tonight. And uh, next week, uh, actually, there is no next week, right? Next week is 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 spring break, isn't it? Okay, so in two weeks, we will do. Uh, to the avascular tumor steroid and chemotaxis. Um, it's not spring break for me in the sense that I'm here. Uh, and so you're certainly not required to meet with me next week. But if, if you want to talk about projects or about anything else, I'm here this week and next week. So I'm, I'm available to talk with you. And I'd encourage people, don't, don't, don't wait to have a lot of progress on your project to talk to me. In the sense, if you don't have project progress on your project, it may be even more important to talk to you. And don't be shy. I'm not going to lecture you about you, what you should have done. I just want to try to make, help people to make sure that you're making progress as, as effectively as possible, given what you want to do. So, so, so it's okay to sit with me and say, I don't know what to do, or we haven't done anything. What should we do? Or what can we do? And we can read the paper together or try to rough something out together on concrete. So I'm happy to spend time doing that. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Good night. And I will see you in two weeks for class. And, and I hope uh, individually before that. <laughs>